Let's go, what I have up on the screen, 2 Samuel 12, we'll start there. Um, but let's, um, let's start out with a word of prayer, and several of our folks need prayer. Sister Linda Toomey, um, the fluid buildup is back again with her, and uh, she's asking for prayer. Sister Pam, uh, Sister Bonnie, Roy is not doing well tonight with his blood pressure, so we're going to pray for Roy tonight. And I'm sure there are others, and we'll take some prayer requests here uh, toward the end of the service. Um, I, I don't want to forget uh, McKenna uh, is 17 today. So happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. Okay. And at that age, they really do know everything. Okay. But they forget it so quickly. You know. Happy birthday, McKenna. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, all right? Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you, Lord. This is good weather, nice weather you've given us. We thank you for it. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be able to come to your house tonight to honor you and to worship you and to get together with God's people. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the ability to come into your house and uh, share our griefs, share our burdens with one another. Father, we ask, God, that you bless uh, Brother Tim and all of his family. Lord, it was a joy, it was a blessing, to, it was an honor to be able to talk to them today. And Father, you know why things happen the way they do. You know more than we do. Your, your thoughts are, in fact, higher than our thoughts, and your ways are higher than our ways. We don't dare presume, God, to think that you've done something wrong. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless that family. And um, thank you, Father, for letting them be a blessing to me today. Um, to share this time with them. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless Christopher. And Lord, if it be your will that he lives and gains his strength back, then, Father, what a story that will be. But, Lord, it's an even greater story because you're not only the God that can stop people who are sick from being sick anymore and give them healing, but you're also the God who raises the dead back to life. And... Father, we believe that at the end of everything, that's what you're going to do. You're going to bring him back to life again, and he'll walk the streets of gold with you for eternity. And what a, what a comfort that is to our souls. Father, the sting of death still stings, and it still hurts those of us down here. It's a reminder of our sins. But we are thankful, God, that we have a Savior who heals all of our diseases, whether in this life in a temporary way or in the next life in a permanent way. So, Father, we ask, God, that you bless that family, and bless Chris, and, uh, Lord, just have your way in his life, in his body, and, Lord, just be with that family. Bless all those, Lord, who are watching and Joining with us online tonight, I pray, dear God, that our church would be a blessing to them. And we thank you, Lord, that all of those people are a blessing to us the way they are. Father, we pray, dear God, that you would bless the food distribution that's going on this week. Bless those who carry the food out. Bless those, Lord, who receive it. Bless the food. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would always allow us the blessing of sharing more and more of what you provide for us. I pray, dear God, that you would let us be a blessing to those good people there in Kenya. And Father, we do pray for them that, Lord, as they receive the physical food this week, and God, that they would be so inclined to receive the spiritual food as well, and that they would hear about Jesus, the, the true Jesus, the real Jesus. And Father, that many people would be saved, many people's lives would be impacted, and their souls, Father, Everlasting, eternal souls would be saved for your kingdom and your glory's sake. 
Father, we just are always careful to give you the praise in everything that happens. And Father, if there's somebody here, Lord, tonight, or somebody watching online, maybe their week isn't going so well. Maybe just today was not such a good day. I pray, God, that you would help them. Lord, as they call upon you, as they cry out to you, I pray, the Lord, that you'd hear from heaven. And God, that you would forgive their sins, that you would heal their diseases. And Lord God, that you would just uh, aid them in their walk of life. Lord, open up your word to our eyes and our hearts tonight. Help us, dear God, to be attentive. And Lord, let your word be fruitful in our life for your kingdom's sake. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Uh, we're studying the topic of prayer and fasting. Uh, I've already had uh, several people call and they want um, copies of this. When I get the series done, we'll put it on a special DVD and have that available. It'll automatically be posted online. It'll be at sermonaudio.com or, and let me, let me just say this while I'm doing this, sermonaudio.com slash Bethel or facebook.com slash Pastor Mike Online are the two streaming places that we send our stream out. And if you can't get one, try the other, write both of those down um, and or set it as a bookmark on your phone or your tablet, however you watch it, or on your Roku. If you get a Roku TV, you can access Sermon Audio through Roku and you can pick it up there. That's how uh, Lisa's mom and dad are watching tonight. Lisa, pray for Lisa's mom and dad. Her dad had another chemo Monday and it's really bothering him. And then last night, um, her mom had to go to the ER. She just, a spell came over her and and she's still just very, very, very weak. And so we ask you to pray for them. But that's where they are tonight. And they're watching on their, on their Roku, on their TV. So that's how you get our streaming things. And then you can pick those up later on, at the same places, sermonaudio.com or Facebook. If Pastor Mike Online is a page, you don't have to be a member of Facebook to watch. Um, it's an open page. So, but they'll be available after that. And we'll have them on DVD as well. All right. Now, what we got to last Wednesday night was this topic. And, and I've heard this from the name it, claim it crowd. Uh, there have actually been books written by some of these um, charismatic, word faith type TV exploiters, I call them, because that's what they do. They exploit people for, for gain. They think gain is godliness. Paul said it right when he named these people, thinking that gain is godliness. They think that if you have a lot of money and you're successful and you're rich, then that's evidence that you're saved. And if you, don't, and if you think you're saved, but you don't have a lot of money and you're in poor health, obviously you're not saved the way they're saved. And that's the thing that they want everybody to believe in. That if you have more money, then that shows God's favor in your life. But they've, several of them have written books about fasting. And they basically say that if you fast in the right way, with the right positive thoughts, with the right positive intentions, and you do it all correctly, then God absolutely will do whatever it is that you're asking or demanding Him to do, that God has to do it because it's His promise and He always keeps His promise, and so on and so on. And I've had, this is what really gets me. There was, used to be a lady called our ministry several years ago, and she's now gone on to be with the Lord. She was slowly dying of some sort of lung disorder. And there'd be times I could tell she was on a respirator. She was talking, she'd have oxygen going in. Shortness of breath all the time. And she had a group of friends that were telling her that if she would just fast and pray and believe that God would heal her, that God had to heal her, and she would not be sick anymore. And the fact that she's sick, it's her fault that she's, that she's dying of this. And she would call me several times and ask me, is this true? No, Deborah, it's not true. D these people are lying to you. And these people are not your friends. If they're telling you that, they are not your friends. What they're doing is they're using you as a guinea pig. They want, they want to see if it really works or not. Because they've never had it tested like you're having it tested. They've never had it tried in the fire like you're having it tried. They want to see if it's true or not, and they want to impose it on you. And then if it just happens to work, then they'll, then they'll really believe it. But they were down in this poor woman. 
she was down in the dumps anyway because she knew she was dying and they were telling her she was dying because it was her own fault because she didn't have enough faith to be healed she didn't fast long enough or whatever and they'll tell you that if you just fast with these positive thoughts and do all these things right that God must give you what you ask for and then when it doesn't work they come back on you and they say well obviously you're not doing something right and you're dis you're disrespecting God and God won't heal you and that angers me because it puts people in bondage that they themselves cannot get out of so when I came across these verses doing this study of fasting and prayer I wanted to be sure to include this it is not a guarantee that you're going to get everything that you stomp your foot at God at and demand God does not we are not spoiled brats in God's kingdom he does not have to give it you have to understand God doesn't owe you a thing he does not owe you a thing anything that God does for you and God gives to you he is given to you because of his grace and for his mercy's sake but he doesn't owe you anything 2nd Samuel 12 22 in fact let's turn to 2nd Samuel 12 what is the what is the the context of 2nd Samuel what is this story about in 2nd Samuel chapter 12 well the story is that David committed a sin that he should have never committed it started before he ever saw Bathsheba and I'll tell you how it started it started when David's mighty men came to David and said, David, you're too important to be out here in the front line with us warriors. We can't afford to let the light of Israel go out. So David, why don't you start staying at home in the palace? We'll fight all the battles for you. David was used to being on the front line. He was a front line general, not one of them Pentagon generals that sit in the office while the guys go out and, and are slaughtered just to take a hill. David was on the front line all the time leading the charge. And was he ever killed? No. He was never killed, ever. So, but his mighty men, they were, they were, they were afraid. David, we can't afford to lose you. So you go back, back to the palace. We'll fight all the wars. So David does that. And while he's back at the palace and he has nothing to do, he's sitting up on top of his palace roof watching all the women go down and take a bath that's where he started lusting after Bathsheba that's where he called her that's where he committed adultery with her sent her home and then all of a sudden now she's got a child David's going to try to cover this up so he calls Uriah one of his mighty men one of David's own mighty men David betrayed his own man brought Uriah the Hittite back from the field of battle to try to cover up the pregnancy Uriah refused to go home to his wife he goes back out to the battlefield. David sends word out there he's to be put on the front line. In other words, I want him killed. Sounds like a Bill Clinton plan to me. Sleazy kind of stuff. And so that's what happens. You ride the Hittites killed. David says, oh, this poor widow, I'm going to take her in to be my bride. So then she has the baby, but the baby's very, very, very sick. And so David fasts and prays now according to the charismatic movement because he had positive thoughts or whatever he should get what he wanted God was not gonna let this happen so 2nd Samuel chapter 12 let's look at uh, verse 18 it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will, we then vex, how will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped and then he came to his own house, and when he were required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said, then said, and he, by the, he fasted seven days, according to this. And so he anointed himself, verse 20, and changed his peril. Well, I already read that. Verse 21, then his servant said unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. 
And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fastened and wept, for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? So that was in David's mind. Maybe God will be gracious. Maybe he will. Okay? Now, is God still gracious? Was God still gracious to David? Absolutely. Okay? And I've mentioned this before. But the grace of God extended far beyond that. Even though David didn't get what he wanted with this child being alive, David went on with Bathsheba to produce a second son. Does anybody know who the second son of Bathsheba was? Solomon. The greatest king in all all of the world aside from jesus christ without a doubt the greatest king in the earth was king solomon no one exceeded him as far as wealth as far as strength as far as honor as far as wisdom and beauty no one excelled king solomon no one did so you see grace here grace was definitely there when it came to solomon okay but things had to be the way things were because of David's sin. And here's what some people think. That they can sin grievously and perform certain religious rituals and God won't still get them for what they did. That's what some people think. I mean, why do you think most Italian mafia families have a priest in the family? Why do you think that? So they can have somebody who can, number one, forgive them for all the stuff they do. And they really believe that their cousin Vinny, the priest, can absolve them from all the murders, all the illegal transactions, all the rapes, all the trafficking, all of that stuff. And forgive them scot-free and everything's going to be okay they actually believe that nonsense okay so but people actually believe that if they just do a few things to appease God that God will say okay it's okay what you did's fine everybody does it don't worry about it I'm okay with it and that's not God we learned a few weeks ago Sunday school lesson about Whatsoever you sow, that shall ye also reap. If you've sowed bad things into your life and you get saved, are you still not going to reap those bad things? You sowed them. You sowed them. And I think the expectation of some Christians is, well, I got saved, that should just exclude me from having any problems whatsoever. And it doesn't. They, got, they sowed them into their life. They're there, okay? So it's not a guarantee. Turn to Jeremiah 14. Jeremiah 14. All of us people that 50 years old and up, do we not regret 90% of the stuff that we did 30, 40, 50 years ago. And why do we regret it? Because of the effects that it's had in our adult life. The horrible, terrible scars and effects that it has on us. And it follows us for years down the road. Things that were done that can't be undone. And by the way, that's what abortion is. It's trying to undo something that should have never been done to begin with. And as, that's why that liberal crowd is so fiercely adamant about being pro-abortion. Is that their whole mindset is, I can do whatever I want and I shouldn't have to suffer any consequences for it. That's why they think the way they think. You vote for them rascals if you want to. I just don't have to like you anymore. Amen. Jeremiah 14, verse 10. 
Thus saith the Lord unto this people. Thus have, have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. In other words, they, they don't stop sinning. They just don't quit. They just keep doing it, doing it, doing it. Like there's no punishment, there's no repercussions, there's no bad mojo for it or nothing. They just keep doing it. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, pray not for this people for their good. Man, you didn't know that was in the Bible, did you? God telling you not to pray for somebody. Don't pray for them and don't pray for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. Boom, there it is. Underline that in your Bible. God says, they've crossed the line now. Oh, but see, they're fasting and praying. God says, I don't care. Let them starve to death. Let them starve to death. I told them not to do these things. I warned them. I long suffered with them. I begged them. I sent prophets out. And you know what they did? They killed the prophets. They didn't want to hear it anymore. So it, it's, it's, we've gone past the point of, well, maybe if I fast now. Um, Lisa had a relative I used to work with in construction. And he was a heavy smoker, smoked all of his life. And he ended up really bad sick. So he goes to the doctor. The doctor says, well, guess what? You got lung cancer. Oh, no. Should I quit smoking? You can if you want, but it's not going to help. It's too late. Smoke if you want to, because it's not going to change the outcome of this diagnosis. It's gone past the point of being able to be fixed. It can't be fixed anymore. God must have got to that point back in the days of Noah when people got to the point to where all they thought about was doing evil continually and they never stopped and it finally got to a point to where God said, I'm done. Oh, we're going to stop sinning now. Hey, Noah, open the ark. It's not going to do any good. You're past the point of me doing anything for you so enjoy all the sin you want to, but it's not going to change anything. And that's where these people are right now. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. When they offer burnt offering and an, obl an oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. And God meant what he said. So you got two witnesses in your Bible telling you that just because you fasted and prayed, that's not an automatic guarantee. So, I mentioned those three days. There's been other times when I fasted, but I remember those three days. I remember those three days, and I remember the, the process that God brought me through. And for a while, I was saying, God, well, maybe we could do this. God, maybe we can do that. And at some point, I just... I quit telling God maybe what we could do as a church or what I could do as a minister or whatever. And I just said, God, you need to fix me. You need to change me. You need to do something in me or something in this church or something. And I'm going to wait on you to do it. I'm going to wait on you to fix it. It's going to be up to you. And finally, God took over. But get it out of your mind that fasting is a 100% guaranteed. If you fast and pray, then these things have to happen. It doesn't work that way. Um, that's not the only time today that I've ever prayed for somebody who was very close to death for God to heal them. It's not the only time that I've ever done that. And I can tell you that there's been a time or two where God turned it around, and I mean, he can do that. But one of the things that I've learned in all the years of serving God is I've learned that my wisdom is not like God's wisdom. And for me to trust my own wisdom is probably not going to be a good idea. So I've learned to trust God. 
and what he wants to do, I've learned to be okay with that. The word resolve was a word that God caught, taught me years ago. And I finally said, God, I don't care what you do as long as you do it. If it's you doing it, then I'll trust that because I know my God's a good God. Amen? Now, Matthew 6. Rule number one for fasting. Always, always, always do it in secret. One of the things in our church's, I guess, membership statement, there's actually a, a church covenant that was drafted long before I came on the scene. And for someone who wants to join the church, I don't think I've read it to anybody in years, but um, it used to be in the front of our hymn books. I don't even know if it's there anymore. But it was a covenant if somebody wanted to join this church, and it was just an agreement that they were going to make about being a member of the church. And I can remember some of the things that were on there. It's been a long time since I read it. But one of the things that was on there was giving yourself to daily Bible reading and giving yourself to secret prayer. Secret prayer. Now why is secret prayer so special? What, is there anything wrong with praying in public? No. Okay? When we go to a restaurant, we sit down and eat, we pray, even if the waitress is standing there with plates in her hand, if she walks up while we're praying, she has to wait we're praying there's nothing wrong with praying in public nothing wrong with being seen to pray in public there's nothing wrong with me asking somebody in this church to lead us in prayer uh, it's always going to be a man I believe in that I ask one of the men to lead in prayer and they'll lead in prayer so there's nothing wrong with that but if you specifically pray and or fast to be seen then there's a problem with it so Matthew chapter 6, he addresses this. Uh, verse 16, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. God says, I don't care what they're praying about. I have no concern whatsoever what they're actually praying for because that's not what they really want. What they really want is to be seen of men. They want men to look at them and say, oh, brother so-and-so, he's so godly. Look at him. I don't know how you disfigure your face to make it look like you're fasting. I don't. But they, apparently they were good at it. But they wanted men to look at them and say, Oh, he's so godly. He's so... Let me throw something in with this. I believe men all look like men. I believe women all look like women. And I think God's people ought not to look like the world, look lascivious, look flirtatious, look in an ungodly manner. I may not be able to define it, define it, but I know what I see it. But I've been part of fundamentalist Christianity all my life. I have never attended a liberal church in my life, ever. And I know that fundamentalists like to boast about their outward godly appearance. Okay? They love to boast about that. And they like to boast or make comments to other people. That family there, that family is so godly. They don't have a television in their home. They're a godly family. Does having a television or not having a television make someone a godly or an ungodly person? Does that have anything to do with it? No. 
Uh, Josh Duggar taught us that. Part of the Duggar family, the oldest son, and while he was going around making speeches in churches all over the country about how godly he was, he was paying women on these online apps behind his wife, behind everybody's back. And he was into the thousands of dollars every month doing this stuff. Okay? So, yeah, he had a good upbringing, but he obviously had a problem, and the outward appearance failed to cover that up long enough for him. Okay? So, we're, I can tell you, we are, as fundamentalists, are both bad about looking at others and saying they're godly, or receiving that admiration from others saying, he's a very godly person, look at how he's dressed, look at, how, look at it. his hair is short. You see my hair is short, John? That means I'm a godly man. Okay? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. One thing this Bible tells us, don't look on the outward appearance. But he said in verse 17, But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head, wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And back during those three days, the only reason why anybody like Rose and my wife and whoever else was here at the time knows that I was in my office really struggling and wrestling with God was there is a great big plate glass window between my office and the secretary's office. I call it the fishbowl. Okay? Only it's the women in Rose's office that are the fish in the bowl over there. And they don't like it when you tap on the glass either. I didn't found that out. Okay? And that's there for a reason. In case I have to counsel with a woman, somebody can go in that room and sit. Brother Goff put that in. Great idea. Okay? But that was the only way that they knew that I was in there really struggling because they could see me in there. Other than that, I just had to make a big deal of it. I didn't go around telling everybody, hey, I'm fasting this week, I'm fasting. You want to know what it's about, huh? I didn't do that. And don't do that ever. Don't do it ever. If you're going to fast and pray, fast and pray. Get along with God. If, you're gonna, if, you're gonna, if you choose to do it here, do it here. Let me know about it, and I'll make this room off limits to everybody. Okay? That way your secret is safe. But as a, as a religious exercise to go about so that everybody can see how spiritual and how holy you are, Jesus said, cut it out. Don't do it. If that's what you want, then I'll give you that reward. I'll let everybody think you're the most godly person in the world. But that's all you're going to get. Okay? Uh, so turn to Ezra chapter 8. This was me. Ezra chapter 8. I needed to see God's way. Ezra chapter 8. These are, you could put this under the category of why would I fast? Why do I need to fast? We've already learned at the beginning of this that there are devils that just won't leave. And this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. But there are other reasons why you might want to fast. Ezra chapter 8. Uh, if, for those who don't know, let me set up Ezra and Nehemiah for you. Ezra and Nehemiah are the... When God... Israel was in the land, the land of promise, and God had went through all these years. Of sometimes they served God, sometimes they didn't. God long suffered with them. But finally, God had enough out of the ten northern tribes, what they called uh, Israel, and their capital was Samaria, and God had had enough of them. And so he had the Assyrians come down steal every one of the Jews out of the, the land of Israel and took them off into slavery into Assyria. Well, that left Judah and Benjamin to reside where Jerusalem was the capital. 
And finally, after a while, God got tired of their sins and he sent Nebuchadnezzar in to grab them, take them, put them in slavery for 70 years, and they destroyed the temple. At the end of 70 years, God allows them to come back because he said it's only going to last 70 years. So he allows them to come back. They come back into the land, and Ezra and Nehemiah are the two books in the Bible that tell you about the Jews coming back to their land. They're prophecies, by the way. They're prophecies, okay? It's going to happen again. But Ezra and Nehemiah, one of them is about building the wall around Jerusalem for protection. The other one's about building the temple so they can serve God again, okay? But in Ezra, you've got people now that were never born in Jerusalem or in the land of promise. They were Jews born in Babylon. And they had never heard the word of God. They didn't know anything about it. So they come back and they need to be trained and taught how to be Jews. What, what's this temple? Why are we building this temple? What, we had a temple in Babylon. Why did we just stay there? No, our temple is going to be different. And they had to teach them and train them about how to be Jews again, all right? So that's the setup for Ezra and Nehemiah. In Ezra chapter 8, verse 21, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God. Underline that. That is the, the role that fasting performs. That's its place in the universe. It is about denying the desires of the flesh. Okay? And fasting is just, I guess, the tip of the iceberg. Our flesh wants a lot of things all the time, doesn't it? You'd be surprised at the number of adults I catch in my office with their hand in a box of chocolate. I just needed chocolate. That's fine. I didn't say nothing. Okay? So fasting is affliction of your flesh. It's, to, it's your day to tell your flesh, not, today's not your day. Me and God's going to have a talk and we're leaving you out of it. Now your flesh may knock on the door all day long and vex you, but you're telling the flesh, no, today's not your day. I'm telling you it's not your day. So the, to afflict ourselves before our God and to seek him of him a right way for us. Underline that. That's one of the reasons why you fast. God, I need to know which way to go. So let's say that you've got a really, really big, potentially life-altering decision to make. Like, are you going to get married to this person? I'll say this, are you going to stay married to that person? Are you going to stay where you are as far as your physical location? Or are you going to move? Are you going to accept a job where you're hauling beer? And that's a big decision. People ask me that question, like, should I take this job? It's doing this. I don't know. Any kind of decision that is important enough to you to where if you, you know if you do the wrong thing, God's going to be really ticked off at you. And that's something you want desperately to avoid. I would spend a day fasting and praying about it. I get, listen, I guarantee you, God's always helping you when it comes to you wanting to know what God wants you to do. God's, I promise you, God's in that one. I promise you, he will be. Okay, I can't promise you if he's going to heal somebody or whatever. But when it comes for you to know what God wants you to do, I guarantee you, God's going to help you with that one. Okay. The Israelites had it easy. They got up, they looked to see if the pillar of cloud had moved from the tabernacle to some distance away. If it did, that meant that they were moving that day. And where were they going to go? Wherever the cloud took them. Because they didn't know how to get there. They were just going to follow the cloud. And for them, it was that simple. Now, do we have it that simple? I think we can have it that simple. If we look and if we ask. If you'll ask God... He'll show you, okay? Ask and it shall be given, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. That's his promise that he makes to us. So they are fasting, number one, to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones. 
and for all our substance. God, what do you want me to do with my money? God, what do you want me to do with my house? God, what do you want me to do with my children? God, what should my children do? What's the way you, how do you want me to raise my children? God, do you want me to do this with my kids or that with my kids? God, I, I don't know this. And I'm asking you, God, and I want to know. It's important enough to me, God, that I spend a day just me and you so you can tell me what I'm supposed to go and do with myself. Verse 22, for I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way because we had spoken unto the king saying, the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. Do you understand what he's saying here? We've got enemies fixing to kill us and we know that the king that we just left, we know that he said he would help us, but we've been telling him all along, our God will help us. And do you think we're going to go back and tell him, well, our God didn't show up, so will you help us? We're not going to tell him that. So it was important enough, look at where their heart is. Their heart is with the kingdom of God first. They actually care how this looks on God. Do you get that? Have you, have you not ever asked the question, of how the decisions that you make in life make God look to this lost Antifa world. Because way too many people are making God into a laughing stock by their lifestyle. And the world says, your God's not, not real. I know it's not because of the way you act. So, they said, um, for I was ashamed to inquire of the king a band of soldiers horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way because we had spoken unto the king saying the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fastened and besought our God for this and he was entreated of us. Did God answer their prayers? Absolutely. Now notice, they didn't ask, okay God, we're praying so that you'll do this our way. That's not what they were saying. They were saying, God, we're going to fast so that we do this your way. That is the right attitude to have in every prayer. So years ago, the women had a Bible study here one time, and somebody from the charismatic movement had slipped in some people in this Bible study to stir up confusion. Because they had brought one of these life application Bibles, but it was a spirit-filled life application Bible. And in the comments in that Bible, it said, when you pray, you should never say these words, if it be thy will, O God. You should never say those words in your prayer. Because you've just killed your faith. God won't do anything for you if you say that. And they called me because it had got into such a discussion People were kind of upset about it, so they called me to bail them out. And I said, I don't remember what all I said, but I said, well, Jesus prayed that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if there be any other way, let this cap, cup pass from before me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so, but that was in that Bible. That's what they had written there, that... You should never pray, Lord, if it be thy will, because then God won't answer your prayer at all. Baloney. Um, I won't go on. Any, we got several to deal with sin, okay? So next Wednesday night, be prepared to deal with some sins in your fasting and praying. Can God break the yoke of bondage of sin? Okay? And he will by the time we all get out of here. Okay, but don't expect him to do it all at once. Don't expect him to do it that way, because number one, it's not wise. Okay, God knows what he's doing. Should a person, I don't know how to put, should a person quit tobacco and alcohol on the same day? Anybody that's ever smoked and drank? No, probably not. Probably not a good idea. Okay, do what? Okay, first one, then the, you never tried doing, quitting both at the same time, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, don't quit smoking and potty train at the same time. I used to work with a guy, he told me this, he, he laughed about it. He said his, uh, he quit smoking once, didn't say nothing to his wife or nothing like that, he just quit smoking. Said a week later, his wife come in from the store and she had a carton of cigarettes and she hit him on the head with it like she said, don't you ever do this again without telling me first. <laughs> Apparently he was not a nice person.